Okay, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, speakers. Augustine Carstens is the head of the Bank of International Settlement in Basel, the central bank of the central banks, where all the important decisions are made on the international scene and in international finance. And some few words about Augustine. Augustine is a citizen of Mexico. He went as undergraduate to ITAM, and then he did, got a PhD in economics at the University of Chicago. And then he moved into policy making, became finance minister, head of the Central Bank of Mexico. And I think since two, two years, he became the head of the Bank of International Settlement. We will have a fireside chat with Chilean Ted. And Chilean Ted, everybody knows Chilean Ted. <laughs> she is FT uh, editor in the United States. And uh, she wrote famous books. Uh, everybody has read about the crisis. And she, you can read her almost every week in the Financial Times. And Chilean will then have the fire that chat. So the idea is that we will have an introduction by Augustine for about uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes. And then we will go on to a fire side chat where Chilean will ask questions. And you can also throw in questions. And also questions will come in from online as well. Um, I should say that this uh, recording, is rec uh, this uh, talk is recorded and video streamed. So if anybody opposes to it, um, you have to raise your hand now, and then we won't show anybody from the audience. Anybody wants to raise their hand? Otherwise, you might be on TV. Um, with that introduction, I'll give the floor to Augustine, and then we go from there. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you very much, um, um, Marcus. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. And it's a great opportunity to be at Princeton. Um, the topic that I will cover um, is about uh, money and payments and the digitalization of money. Uh, and I will start uh, first addressing this part is too strong. I will start first addressing uh, the issue of the essence of money and then based on that uh, move into uh, applications into payments, and then to talk about the most recent developments in this field, which has to do precisely with digi digitalization and uh, also with, a, a, well, basically applying innovation into this field of economics. Uh, well, let me start with money, the economics of money. We know that the uh, at the end of the day, what makes money work is a social convention. Uh, basically, the key element that makes money work is trust. And uh, what makes uh, it trust of, on what? Trust precisely on the fact that if I exchange, if I exchange, uh, the sound is probably too strong, right? Or, or I better I use this. Because it's double. Yeah. You want to use. Or I, 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 I use this over the later. Okay, so you, you can hear me now better? Okay, great. <laughs> Well, so I was telling you that money is a convention. They basically, what makes the convention work is that you have the certainty that uh, if you're going to pay with something that you received, uh, you will be able to move those resources on and you will get the use or the benefit that you wanted out of money. Now, uh, this is very simple, but the, the truth is uh, to get to this point is very difficult in time. I mean, as a matter of fact, the history of humanity can sort of be followed by uh, precisely uh, looking into the different iterations, different forms in which this uh, type of exchange has taken place. Uh, so through time, there are many different manifestations of uh, different ways to address the issue of money and its role in the economics and how it interacts with, uh, with society. There is always a temptation to think that the issue with money or the problem with money is technologi technological. And what I will claim is, yes, technolo technology is a very important element. It, it helps a lot. Certainly, it helps for this type 
of a, a vehicle, economic vehicle to play its role. It has to keep pace with the rest of the economy. But uh, the institutional arra arrangement behind money is probably uh, uh, the, the most essential element. Uh, let, me, let me start by saying that in, in, in today's, uh, today's uh, uh, debate in economics, a lot of it, it, has been, uh, it has been shaped by three developments. Uh, I would say starting two years ago to today. One, Bitcoin. Second, the incursion of big tech into financial services. Third, Libra. Uh, these developments have been very important because uh, precisely with the background of technology, they have at least tried to challenge the conventional wisdom on money and payment systems. Uh, and, and well, of course, the results have not been completely favorable to them, but that doesn't take away the fact that they have been a very, very important wake-up call for the central banking community. Take Bitcoin. Basically, we'll not go into the details, uh, but basically what Bitcoin ha did is to try to challenge central bank money, and not central bank digital money, but the, the currency issued by central banks. Here the idea was a private, a private grouping. Uh, I mean, not an institution, but it was just a society in general was going to, to participate in a game where money was going to be produced. And through, uh, through certain rules, that would perform the role of money. And therefore, the society would not need precisely of an institution like a central bank to issue money. Uh, big tech. Big tech is basically the application of telecommunications, huge capacity to process uh, data and uh, the cloud computing to basically uh, the big techs to participate with huge network advantages into providing uh, financial services. And what big tech did is to challenge not the essence, not, 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 not the institution of money, but how financial services could be delivered in the economy. Uh, the third one is a combination of, of the two, which is uh, Libra. Libra wanted to bring into, into the game a completely new currency, which is precisely Libra and therefore challenging also uh, the prevalence of, of central bank money, and then also do some form of financial intermediation, uh, very likely probably of big tech. So we see that in, in, in a very small window of time, we see these major challenges to conventional practices. Uh, technology really has uh, made these challenges to be possible. In the past, uh, it would be very, very difficult to try to think some, something of this scale. Uh, now, Bitcoin didn't progress. Bitcoin and cyber, cyber currencies are still out there, but nobody really considers them as a substitute for money. Uh, they are an asset class. Uh, they can be used to invest. They can be used for gambling, uh, for illicit transactions but they, they really cannot, uh, they cannot be considered as part of, a, of a traditional money where uh, it serves as a unit of account, medium, uh, medium of, of exchange store of value. Big tech really, uh, uh, in particular, the application of this in China really has progressed. Uh, hundreds of millions of accounts. Uh, but uh, recently, the regulatory action of the PBOC has reined the F14, and they are working. And they are working really well. But but uh, what is interesting to prove is that, at least from the point of view of financial aspects, it has sort of stayed in the realm of what is the traditional financial practices. Uh, that doesn't take away that there are aspects in terms of competition 
data man management and so on, but they, in a way they have conformed with a, a lot of the institutional arrangements be, be behind financial services that we face today. Uh, so so uh, what have we, at the end of the day, we as the central banking community obtained of all of this? Well, more than anything, it's a huge wake-up call, a huge wake-up call that there is technology out there that can be used to really challenge uh, what are the traditional services that central bankers, banks provide. Now, the analysis uh, from the central banking point of view, should this be addressed as a pure technological issue or should also be addressed more from a central banking point of view? At the end of the day, I think what is essential is the economics behind uh, all what these, these, uh, these different operations and all different developments try to, uh, try to deliver. Uh, basically, if we, we take, for example, Bitcoin, and if we, t if we take into account Libra, uh, basically what we see is that, uh, is that there are fundamental weaknesses out there from the point of view that there are not governance arrangements behind them that uh, give sufficient confidence in terms of what will determine the value of those monies. In terms of Bitcoin, uh, really what would anchor the value of the currency or the, of, of that unit of, of money uh, was the algorithms that, that basically determined the supply or the, or the progress of supply of Bitcoins. Uh, in principle, they, they were immutable, but then uh, down the road we have found out that they are not as immutable as we thought. Uh, for example, they can be forked, uh, uh, you know, there are different arrangements that the majority can come up with, and that can generate certainly uh, uh, affect that really can affect the value of those of those currencies. And uh, and the other thing that we found out is that they are not as solid from the point of view of a key component of that a monetary unit has to comply with, and that is when it is exchanged the transaction is final. What does this, this mean? That once I gave you the unit of account, it's not reversible. And you have the certainty that you have received the value that you were expecting. That was never assured, fully assured in the case of Bitcoin, and that's a major problem that uh, that, that, that unit of account had. In the case of Libra, I mean, one way of, of assure the value of a, a currency is by very specific rules. In the case of Libra was take Bitcoin, stable value. There, therefore, there, the, the, the issue is how can we import the value that a currency needs? And therefore, they are using uh, units of account or money that has value, that has stable, stable value, and, and, and they are trying to import it into their own currency. Therefore, it's a, it's, it's, it's a construction that by itself doesn't assure the value of, of the currency. It depends 100% on how it is backed. And what we have learned through history is that all the different uh, exercises to both in private and public money that depends on backing, eventually there are incentives to cheat and those backings end up not working. Uh, we have the case of Bank of Amsterdam, but we have many other examples uh, where at some point uh, the backing elements uh, succumb. Uh, in, in general, the history of private money has been uh, quite, quite it's, it's, it's very clear. There are very few examples where this has really progressed, so long, almost non, no, no examples, at least to, 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 to provide a, 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 a generally used a unit a, a, a money, I would say, in, in, a, in a national environment. Uh, so what has been the solution that society has come up with, not, not in the last year or in the last 10 years, but for, from over 100 years ago? Well, is to basically to create institutions within the state 
which, which main assignment is to try to precisely regulate issues of money and have as its main mandate how to, how to uh, preserve the value of money. I think that is the number one assignment for uh, this govern government uh, institution. This is the central bank, and it has worked really well. I mean, if you if you read today uh, any any analysis, there is no doubt that central banks have been very successful in this respect. I mean, the fact that that uh, there are experiments or there are attempts to find different di different types of monies is not because the central bank has failed in general in uh, this task of preserving the value of money, but is more, uh, is it supplied in such a way that can be applied in a more, I would say, flexible way into the new, uh, new applications of technology. Uh, then there are other very important uh, characteristics of what the central banks uh, 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 all, all, all the other other aspects of, of, of what other I would say what I would call central bank public goods uh, th that they offer that, that are extremely extremely valuable. One is the, the fact that they assure finality and this is assured by the fact that in today's uh, payment systems which are basically organized in a two-tier system, uh, one, uh, the central bank is the one who issues issues the currency, provides the basic infrastructure for clearing and settling, and then the interface with the private sector is, is and with the final user is provided by the private sector. What makes this work is that at the end of the day, those payments that are made uh, between people, uh, they are settled in the in the in the books of the central bank, and that assures the finality of it. If you don't have that, there is not assurance that those payments will be will be final. The third uh, public good that the central bank provides is for a payment system to work. It really requires a lot of intraday liquidity. I mean, today uh, something that is very very uh, topical is the promise that the Fed had in September. In its, uh, in the, its money market is the management of liquidity. Uh, imagine the liquidity you need to make the payment system to work. If you don't have an institution like the central bank to provide that liquidity, the, the payment systems could end up in a gridlock and it pro pretty much wouldn't, wouldn't work. And uh, in an extreme case, in a, in a case of stress, what really is important is the lender of last resort uh, role of the central bank, which means that if the central bank is not there to, to block the holes, the payment systems would unravel and that would generate huge economic consequences uh, with huge losses for society in general. And the final role that the central bank plays is, is precisely to establish standards for payments and regulation uh, to have a, a, a well-developed payment system. So these uh, central bank uh, public goods are of the essence. We require them no matter where technology is taking us. Uh, so taking that, that as, as central, which I would say that's why central banks are called central banks, uh, here the idea is let's look into the future. What comes next? Where is where, where I think that technology can be used, having uh, the role of the central bank at, at its core, at the foundation, the foundation of a building that you don't see, is not very sexy, what uh, everything is underground, but is essential for the payment system to subside. Um, so there are two basic alternatives. One alternative is to go into central bank digital currency. The other is how can we improve the, the workings of today's uh, payment systems that are, are based on a, a current accounts in the different financial intermediaries that at the, end of, at the end of the day settle their accounts in the central bank. In both, I would say, the central bank plays a very, very important role. Uh, 
if we go into central bank digital currencies, there are two types of presentations that have to do more than anything who has access to those, those, those type of central bank monies. One is wholesale, the other is retail. Wholesale is something that has existed already for many, many, many years. Uh, basically, this is what are used to settle uh, securities transactions. This is what uh, commercial banks do in their payments using the different payment systems that the Fed provide. Uh, so there, there really is not much of a novelty there. Uh, where, where the novelty really would come is in terms of a retail. And uh, if in, in retail here, uh, there, there, there would be two major opportunities or two major avenues to move this forward. One is to have the central bank digital currencies at the, 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 at the retail level based on accounts, which would mean that each individual would have an account in the central bank. The other would be through tokens, which basically imagine that instead of having bills and coins, you have a token, which is a digital representation of that money. You would need to have a vehicle to hold this. Basically, this would be probably with a wallet, but you would be able to exchange payments without going through an intermediary. Uh, this, these two avenues out, are out there. The main implication for this is to get to give access to the public at large to accounts with the central bank. Uh, one is the central bank would have a very, very prominent role in the financial system. Uh, obviously, the private sector still would be able to provide payment services, but they would have to compete against the central bank. There, from the point of view of, of credit quality, rel reliability, it would be very difficult to uh, compete against the central bank. In, in, in times of stress, it would be especially stress of a financial institution. It would be relatively easy to run from commercial banks into the central bank, and that could have financial stability issues. The reallocation of resources uh, in the financial system would probably affect the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. And the real question here is, uh, what would really be the worth, the, the welfare gains of the population, no? Uh, is, is, are we in a situation where right now people are claiming for this? Uh, or are we in a situation that no other than the central bank can provide these services? Uh, the answer is no. I mean, right now, the private sector under the current system that we have is able to provide fast payments, very efficient. Uh, yes, uh, obviously they can remunerate them, they can provide different services. In principle, th those, will be, those would be the margins with which they would compete against the central bank. Uh, but I think that a, a good division of labor that we have today uh, is present, and I think that is giving us a good, a good, a, a good situation. So therefore, at least from my own point of view, what we need to think is how can we make the payment systems uh, work much better with its current, uh, it, with, uh, its current architecture. And there I would say what would be key is precisely to allow for more competition in the payment space. Probably what we would need to authorize is to have more uh, payment uh, payment uh, providers access to the central bank accounts. Uh, in that way, they would also benefit from the centrality of the central bank. Uh, uh, that, that, would give them, that would give them, I would say, a, a much better uh, access uh, to different uh, layers of, of, uh, of society. Um, Another very important thing that I that uh, that probably where we're falling behind is the fact that we don't have very well established standards for payments and for messaging. Uh, therefore, uh, the way uh, 
techni technological developments are being manifested today is what, what we call world gardens, which is basically the different institutions or different initiatives come with these very important efforts to develop the, the payment systems. But basically what they want to do is to capture a big share of the market without uh, anticipating the need for interconnected interconnectedness with other systems. Is imagine of the discussion with the internet when we had different providers or, or, or telecom companies where you only could call to those who are subscribed to the same service. And that obviously is very, very inefficient. The same thing could happen in a, in a payment systems. Uh, and therefore, I think what uh, authorities would need to develop is precisely how, how to, uh, how to uh, facilitate the messaging, how to establish the, the adequate standards for there to be broader interconnection uh, in, the, in, the, in the marketplace. Of course, another two important additional challenges is the one of inclusion and the other is of cross-border payments. Uh, in many countries where inclusion is, is, is an issue, a, a, a very important part of the problem is that they don't have the basic infrastructure. Uh, many of them start by the fact that they don't have a, a adequate identification of the population. There is not good management of data. And of course, uh, there is no uh, payment infrastructure to facilitate everything. Now, there has been examples where all these have been leapfrogged. Uh, what India has been doing is great with what is, is called the India stack, where you have a stack on ide identification and an ID of, con of consent and, a, a, and, I, a, 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 and also a stack on payment. Uh, this can be applied in a very effective way. Uh, also, if this is done with the centrality of the cent central bank, you can hook up there the different private sector providers, including uh, the big tech companies, and it can become a very, very competitive environment. But at the end of the day, the payment stack is connected, is connected to, the, to the central bank. Uh, in terms of uh, inter, 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 in cross-border payments, uh, well, basically there, uh, what is important is to develop precisely uh, corridors, payment corridors between the different uh, nations. Uh, this can be done in a bilateral way. I would say that there are three basic elements for cro cross-border payments that are of the essence. One is the AML CFT component, which is the most difficult to solve. Uh, the other is the foreign exchange component, and that's relatively easy to solve. The third one is the, the interface of private providers that with technology you, you really can abate the costs. So you can do all of this uh, with, with the current system, uh, just uh, applying policies to facilitate transactions, and you basically don't need a whole new design. So let me, let me conclude. Uh, my conclusion is the following. First, uh, if you analyze all these developments in detail, uh, you come to the conclusion and you might think, well, I'm, all, oh, I'm tooting the horn of central banks. Yes, because I come from an institution of central banks, but where the value of central banks is valid and is huge. Uh, I think the problems that central banks from an institutional point of view have solved is still a problem, is still very valid and still represents a very important platform to build future payment systems as we move into the future. Uh, what we have been seeing is that we are uncovering problems uh, through applications like Bitcoin, like Libra, that if you look back in history, they have already been addressed and they have been addressed through central banks. And that architecture is already there. Uh, the issue is then how can you construct them based on these foundations and uh, welcome uh, innovation. 
Uh, there is, I think, where central banks need to be far more proactive. They need to, they need to think how their own way of doing business can facilitate more the incorporation of technology, how uh, it's uh, public goods that are very important can be benefited by more players. And uh, this would give, obviously, a wider variety of services, more com competition at uh, far lower prices. Uh, here, again, also is the point of standards. We need to move forward more with standards. And, uh, and uh, then there is also uh, this issue of having early engagement with the private sector. I think that a lot of the problems with Bitcoin, with stablecoin, even with big tech and with other innovators is that central banks and authorities in general are in their own bubble and these, all these innovators are, are out there. That also for probably, uh, you know, very specific reasons don't want to engage with authorities. Uh, a lot of their, uh, of, of their uh, attitude is disrupt <laughs> and move on. Now in financial services, if you disrupt, uh, somebody will have to clean up the mess and usually that's the central bank. Uh, so that attitude is not the adequate one. So I think early engagement is very important. Uh, so I think that the process of opening up by central banks is important. An effort uh, that the BIS is uh, spearheading is the creation of the BIS Innovation Hub, precisely is uh, one of the first uh, major uh, signs of uh, enthusiasm by central banks in this field. And basically what we try to do there is to detect in time technology that at some point can disrupt uh, financial activities and central bank practices. How can we address them in time? And how, what can, how can we make the best out of them? The other is how can we improve all these central bank public goods? Those public goods are very important. They can be uh, really fundamental for the development of a modern financial system. And I think that we need to take the leadership on how, how can we preserve and enhance those public goods in particular, how can we apply them in a global environment? And well, of course, we need to generate more human capital in this field in, in, in central banking. Uh, the idea is also to create a major, a major uh, center for experts in these fields. And in that way, we can play our role much better. So in this way, what we are trying to prevent is not to be surprised again by innovators as it happened with Bitcoin, uh, with big tech, and to a less extent with Libra. So I stop here. Thank you very much. Great. Well, do you want to come on up? We're going to have the far side chat, which sounds part of the central bank innovation as well. I don't think central bankers are used to kind of opera Winfrey style far side chats. Well, thank you for that extremely interesting presentation. Um, as somebody who trained as a cultural anthropologist and was never used to be allowed anywhere near you lot, because <laughs> mainstream economists used to look down, or in fact still look down on anthropology, um, I'm fascinated because I spent years of my life arguing that social context, institutions, tribal behavior, cultural patterns matter enormously. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, the subtext of what you've been saying is that you might think central banking is just about a bunch of numbers and computers. And in fact, it's really about social and cultural systems and institutional practices too. Absolutely. It's fantastic. You welcome to the honorary, <laughs> honorary club of anthropologists. <laughs> Are there any other anthropologists in the room or am I surrounded entirely by economists? Well, that was a fair guess, okay. So I'm minority of one. <laughs> well, if any of you ever want to talk about anthropology and central banking, I'm happy to, because in fact, anthropologists have studied central banks mm -hmm. and done some very interesting work there. But I'd like to start with a question. 
some people who are cynics might listen to what you've said and said you're just here to defend the tribal interests of central banks. Does that criticism worry you? No. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, this is, uh, I would say, uh, the result of a very important thought process. I mean, what we have been doing is analyzing the recent manifestations, again, of innovation, uh, what has been behind them. And uh, so central banks basically have two alternatives. Is well, if, if there is something wrong with central banking, how can we fix it? Uh, what would be the alternative? The other is, are we doing the right thing? But then there might be other ways in which this can be probably made more obvious, or, or, or how can this be, how can we move ahead making the advantages of central bank be more useful in all this process? And we are in the second camp. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, as I say, I mean, Bitcoin is not a result of people being unhappy with what central bank, central banks are doing. If you see what is happening today, <laughs> 99.999 of the transactions are done through systems that are have at its core the central banks. So reality is out there. What we are doing works. Now, what has been put into the question is what next? and how can technology be incorporated into what we see today? And that's a challenge. It's more of how can we take advantage of the opportunities and not so much uh, the system is broken today. Right. I cannot say that they, I certainly believe that the system is not broken today. Right. I must say, I mean, Bitcoin, some of the Bitcoin enthusiasts would say that they are doing what they want to do, partly because they're losing faith in fiat currency. So even if they're using you from a payments mechanism, they would argue they're losing faith in fiat currency, and that's one of the issues which is driving them into Bitcoin, a bit like electronic gold, if you like. <laughs> well, they are entitled to have that opinion, <laughs> but as long as society doesn't back them, uh, the proof is the, 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 real, the, the real issue is there out there in society. Right. To what degree do you think that the tribe of central bank governors who gather in Basel, you know, twice a month, I think, or once once a month? Every two months. Every two months, okay. <laughs> um, to what degree do you think they all agree with you? I mean, are you seeing happy consensus between the Fed and the ECB and the People's Bank of China in this respect? Well, I think everybody, I, I think there is a consensus that uh, at least these three events and others really are a wake-up call <coughs> and that we need to pay attention to this and we need to be better prepared in this field. And we need to, I mean, in a way, probably we were in a comfort zone and we were shaken. Uh, it's not only, so we, we need to move from a very defensive attitude to more like uh, trying to, I would say, uh, present much better what central banks do what is our value added and how can that be uh, used as a platform for future developments. I think that in that sense, we need to be more proactive. I mean, some people might say the fact that Libra is coming out or Libra is, is trying to address the issue of, of, of inclusion or cross-border payments is because we haven't really found a solution to those problems, and well, probably they are right. There are issues that we need to tackle. Now, does it mean that the foundations of central bank is wrong? No. And that foundation will be very useful to solve the issue of inclusion and cross-border payments. Right. In terms of the different approaches of governments so in central banks, I mean, there's quite a range of public statements at the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Federal Reserve has not said much and I was at the SEC yesterday and where you had various people like Gary Cohn saying the regulators in America need to get to grips with digital currencies and payments quickly, but nothing has happened yet. Um, you've had quite a lot of noise around the ECB recently. Um, I think Christine Lagarde said just the other day, she came out with this wonderful phrase that said she wanted to, where are we? Um, 
digital, central bank issued digital currencies are an area, quotes, where we have to rush slowly. That's almost Alan Greenspan-esque in terms of the <laughs> ambiguous <laughs> meaning of that. I don't know how you rush slowly. Um, but, um, you know, and then, of course, you've got Mark Carney having indicated he is quite pos po um, positive towards this. And the Chinese have gone in a different direction again. I mean, you're starting to see, I mean, you, I know you say that there's consensus, but actually in practical terms, well, each, quite... each, each country faces a different reality. I mean, I think where a lot of developments have been happening is in emerging markets mm. because uh, they are leapfrogging from a situation of very backward payment systems to very modern ones. <coughs> so you have the examples of M-Pesa, even the case of China. I mean, they didn't go through the time of checks and the uh, credit cards or debit cards and things like that. They are just leapfrogged. Uh, in industrial countries, uh, especially in the US, you have also very good applications provided by the private sector that is what society sees, is what society faces in terms of payments. Uh, so I think that the incentives that different countries face are different. Now, uh, it is clear that the possibilities of technology are there. And the real issue, how are we going to use the, that technology and how can we steer that process in such that we can assure that we will end up in the first best possible way. And that's the process where we are now all interested, mm -hmm. each one starting from a different reality. So in terms of China, for example, you point out in the longer version of your paper that China has really gone through quite an interesting evolutionary path because you know, these payment systems really grew up almost like a wild west mm -hmm. out of central bank government control they have grown up in China to an astonishingly large scale. Mm -hmm. And the central bank has just come in and, if you like, taken back control mm -hmm. by essentially insisting that the tech companies post 100% reserves at the central bank are, are essentially now regulated by the central bank. Do you think that's a good model for America to follow? I mean, well, uh, should we be telling the American authorities they need to go Chinese? No, no, no. I, I think, I think what, what really needs to happen is first to see that that, that, that type of development be, with big techs can take place and to anticipate that and have the adequate regulatory and supervisory environment. As a matter of fact, what happened in China is that they didn't foresee that. And it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew. And, and really there what it threatened was the traditional definition of financial intermediation. Mm. Big techs were doing financial intermediation. They were not being capitalized. They were not subject to liquidity constraints. Uh, so they were basically taking advantage of some of the infrastructure in the financial system uh, without having the obligations or complying with the obligations that the financial intermediary should should comply with. Mm. So there, there the, the real issue is <coughs> how can you establish a level playing field with, with, with other players in, in the economy? And at the end of the day, yes, there were very important risks there by, uh, for example, them uh, lending uh, with uh, resources that were deposited for payment purposes. So there the, the issue was more, not so much of a challenge to the unit of account, but it was more into the process of financial intermediation. Right, right. But I mean, seriously though, I mean, do you think that if we have that kind of rapid growth of big tech in mm -hmm. Europe or the US, and I know you say that the US payment system doesn't necessarily need it because they have all kinds of um, options at the moment, but of course credit cards are taking a lot of money from consumers every time they use mm -hmm. um, any of those systems. Um, do you think the idea of basically saying from the uh, uh, from the offset, actually from, from the start, that if we have these systems, they should place one hundred percent of the reserves with the central bank? Is that something the BIS or the central bankers should just come out and say now? I mean, there are two, in, in your question, there are two issues, and and that's a, that's the 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 thrust of the argument. Mm. When you do 
payments the way they're being done by big techs, especially as they started, <coughs> there is a very weak line between what are strictly payments and what is financial intermediation in general. If they are meant just to do payments, they should be required the 100% reserve requirement. If they are going to, to they, if they are going to do financial intermediation, they should not be subject to the 100% reserve intermediate reserve requirements. But they should be regulated as a financial intermediary. So, so basically, uh, take your pick. What do you want? Do you want to be a, a payment service provider? Mm -hmm. You will be treated like like that. And I claim we should also allow them to flourish. That's why. In my speech, I mentioned that we should open access to the central bank account mm. uh, to PSPs, not receiving overnight overdraft or, or intraday overdraft, but they, yes, to have access to that. And if a, if a PSP uh, wants to become a bank, well, they should become a bank and not subject to the 100% reserve requirement. Okay, so let's turn then to the practical example, which is, which ones of those do you think Libra is going to pick? Well, first of all, I think Libra has to really come to... I mean, I think Libra has benefited... We have benefited a lot from Libra because it has induced a lot of thinking on the official side. The other thing that Libra themselves have benefited is for them to have free consulting for hundreds of <laughs> of public officials, I think <laughs> I think I think what they need to do right now is to get all this reaction, and 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 pretty much rethink what they want to do. There are certain things that they have that are extremely valuable. They have very valuable technology to manage huge amounts of information. Uh, they have network net the network effects. Now they're subject to certain restrictions or they will be subject to cert certain restrictions that they need to internalize. So what I would tell people in Libra is re-optimize and establish links of communication with different authorities so that you develop your model in a way that will not uh, represent a, subject, a, a surprise for you in the future. So, I mean, I have, so what is actually happening? I mean, I have a question here from Michelle Price, who sent an email a question. I'm going to turn to questions from the audience in a moment, but we have a couple of emailed questions. Michelle Price from Reuters says, do you have any more details on the regulatory discussions with Facebook Libra? Is the BIS directly involved? I mean, have you sat down and had a fireside chat with Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> yet? No, with Zuckerberg not, but uh, with David uh, <laughs> Precious, yes. Right. Uh, I have been in panels with him. Uh, I, I guess he has received a lot of consulting from the BIS. Right. Uh, the, the, the key issue is, again, we don't have a very precise model of what Libra is. Mm. We have an idea of what a big tech company could do. A big tech company with, comes with an idea to generate a stable coin. So we, we have reacted to these ideas, but we don't have a final blueprint of what Libra wants to do. So the regula we are not regulating Libra because we don't know really what mm -hmm. Libra is today. Right. Uh, on, on, the, on the potential idea of Libra, some opinions have been expressed. Now, what are the, those opinions? Where, well, if you're going to be backing a currency with assets, as, as, as you as a holder of that unit, for example, do you have a contractual right or do you hold a share on the portfolio who is, who is backing it? That legal precision is of the essence. Mm. Now, for example, I would say a lot of regulation would go in that direction. Yes. Now, if you ask Libra, they don't, know, they, they don't answer to you. They don't know if it's a contractual obligation or, or they, they are basically selling massive ETFs. Hmm. There is no clear answer there. The other is AML CFT. You need to address. But they're selling ETFs, bond funds, without giving any interest, effectively. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then you have AML CFT. Hmm. How are you going to comply AML CFT? 
you get very vague response from them. So what the authorities are saying, you have to comply with AML CFT. How is going Libra to do? Well, we don't know. Okay, so, AM, so it's a, a, AM CFT is for people in the room. It's basically know your customer. It's anti-money laundering and yeah. combating the financing of terrorism. Yes. So there are many practical issues where there is not a clear re regulatory response because there is also no clear clarity for of what Libra really wants to do. Do you think Libra is going to die then? Do you, I mean, if you were a betting person, how much money would you put on the idea that Libra is actually going to ever fly? I, w I would say that Libra will evolve into what I don't know. but it, it hope A new version of M-Pesa? It might be, I don't know. But hopefully it will evolve because it has good ideas behind. Now it has to evolve in such a way that it can conform with what regulation. And it's not because of the sake of regulation, it's not because we know that if those aspects are not taken care of, eventually we will have a failed experiment. And we're not here precisely to anticipate failed, failed experiments. Right. I have another question from Marla Dukaran, who's a chief economist for BIT, with two Ts. How long do you think it will take for central bank digital currencies to become mainstream and why? Uh, uh, it can be very fast. As a matter of fact, uh, in Cambodia, they are already experimenting in real life with CBDCs. Cambodia. In Cambodia. Right. Uh, now, for a country like the US, it might take decades. I mean, it's, 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 it, 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 again, I think this type of question is derived from the fact if it's a technological problem or it's an economic problem. If it's a technological problem, you, you might want to say, well, let's say that this is really what I want to achieve. Each one, each individual in society should have an account in the central bank. How much would it take us to, the, 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 to develop those accounts? How will be the exchanges be taking place? How will be the ledgers be uh, updated uh, in real time? That's a technological problem, and you probably could come with an answer. But, they, but again, here is the part where you and me sort of identify ourselves. This is not a technological problem. It's a political broader issue. And it's an, it think economics need, needs to be there, the politics need to be there, and the social need needs to be there. Right. And that's what is very difficult to answer. Right. Well, that'll be interesting to watch Cambodia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> other question, two more questions, then I can turn to the audience. Aaron Klein, who's a fellow at the Brookings Institute, asks, the US lags far behind the rest of the world in implementing real-time payments. This is my comment, one of the great ironies about the US being innovative. How much of that is because US banks are somewhat unique in that they earn giant revenue from a slow payment system? Brackets, in the aggregate, US banks charged $34 billion in overdraft fees last year. How does this impact the Federal Reserve, who is both the regulator of the payment system and the operator of a payment system that is decades behind the rest of the world? Isn't that a conflict of interest for a central bank? Well, what I would answer is that it's great that the Fed is now moving with Fed now. That it's very good that they're going to develop a face payments. I think that in many parts of the world, the central bank banks have developed payment systems with both with retail applications and large value applications. In most countries, it has worked really well to spur more competition. And I think it's adequate for the central bank to provide more infrastructure in that terrain. Right. That's quite tactful. Excuse me? Quite tactful. <laughs> well, uh, that's what we did in Mexico, so <laughs> I can't speak with experience. Right. Well, I get into the audience of questions, but before we do that, one quick question from my part, which is, you say that you at the BIS want to you know, start bringing in more digital innovation. You want to be, want to avoid being surprised mm -hmm. by somebody like Mark Zuckerberg again. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to try and sort of break down some of the cultural barriers. I have two questions from that though. Firstly, what are you actually gonna do to do that? I mean, are you gonna send, are you gonna create a BIS outpost in Silicon Valley and 
tell the central bankers to wear hoodies and hang out with the techies and find out what's happening. You know, because there are big cultural differences here. And secondly, and this is actually what are quite... hoodies? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of people in the audience who can tell you what a hoodie is and help you out in this. But secondly, there's, a, there's actually a sort of second more important issue, which is that, I mean, I'm very curious about how you're actually going to get that expertise into the central bank or actually get yourselves out of your central bank citadels into the tech sector. Um, and but secondly, isn't one of the problems right now that there's such a sort of sense of silos in the world of m money and pay payments right now that you have a group of people who know a lot about digital currency, sorry, about digital technologies. You have a group of people who know a lot about how money works and not a lot of people who know about both. But and that's, that's a problem of regulation. That's what we want to do, is to bring the two worlds together. I mean, in, in the VIS, as in many central banks, our experts in payments know 70, 80% of economics and finance, 20% of in technology. We need to complement that with people that have 70, 80% of knowledge of technology and 20 or 30% in finance. Uh, we want to get that mix. Uh, we are trying, we are hiring that type of profile. We're going to have, yes, outposts. We have, we already have, are starting one in Zurich, which is our footprint, one in Hong Kong, one in Singapore. And in the last next three to, to four years, we expect to open three or four more uh, centers of the hope around the world. And the idea is precisely to engage with those people with hoodies and try to learn from them. And also for them to learn from us. Because at the end of the day, they also need that knowledge. It's, it's precisely to bridge that. No? Have you ever been to Facebook or have you been to Silicon Valley? Yes, I have been many times to Silicon Valley. I haven't been to, to, to Facebook per se. But yeah, I have been in many startups. I was just in the fintech uh, festival in Zurich, in, the, in Singapore. I had a fire chat uh, in Singapore, which I told them next time invite me to a poolside chat, <laughs> not to a fireside chat. But uh, I, 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 I had uh, tremendous interactions there with many innovators. Right. And it was very fruitful. Well, if you're really going to get into the into the tech world, you need to have a beer pong side chat. That's what, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's what most entrepreneurs are doing these days. But anyway, um, more serious questions. I realise we're surrounded by a lot of economic expertise in the room. Um, Marcus, anyone else who would like to ask some questions? question that might seem a little bit orthogonal, but um, one of your key assumptions is that central banks have done a good job. And as someone from Latin America, I wonder if you can uh, step back and think about that question a little bit more deeply. If you think of Argentina, you think of, of course, Venezuela today, and if you go around the world, think of Zimbabwe, there are certainly any number of cases where central banks have failed their societies. Imagine that you know, a Mark Zuckerberg or some big tech person could somehow provide an alternative to those people. Would you back that? So would you back competition of the central banking system where central banks had palpably failed? What do yes. you say about those sorts of no, situations? I, I would support that. I fully would support that. Uh, I mean, the, the issue is, is then, I mean, central banks are, are not bulletproof. <laughs> uh, I mean, we central banks have very good principles. Most of the time, they are based with very strong laws, very strong mandates. But at the end of the day, it's a political institution. Its mandate is political and it's social. A central bank autonomy is a social and political expression of the will of the people. And if either by, by freedom of people or by the imposition of a dictator, the central bank cannot do its work, it will not do its work and there is nothing to stop that. Now, if things really crumble and at some point you need to restart the currency, 
well, probably the rules of a digital currency might really work. Now, the key is then how do you assure the, the sustainability of that exercise? And how can you transform that into something more lasting? Because if an institution comes like, like Bitcoin or like Facebook or something like that, they come with an objective of maximizing profits. And at some point, the incentive to cheat are very large. So how can you do the transit? So for me, yes, initially they should go to Venezuela and try to fix it. But then how can we move that into something more lasting, I think is what, what the challenge would be. I must say, I do find it fascinating because um, I spend quite a lot of time with consumer industry companies with my anthropology hat on, looking at this whole concept of rever reverse innovation. This idea that instead of assuming the West has the brilliant ideas and then hands them down to the emerging markets, Sometimes you get brilliant ideas in the emerging markets mm -hmm. imported back in. And I do think that your point about Cambodia, your point about you know, emerging market countries experimenting faster, may be one of the first times we're going to see financial reverse innovation on a significant scale in the financial sector. Absolutely. I agree with you. Yeah. Question behind that. Um, Atif Mia, I just want to follow up on Ethan's question because... I was, um, Augustine, sort of very surprised actually by your answer because that would not have been my answer at least. <laughs> um, let me rephrase the question in a totally different context just to make a point that we want to be really careful with this kind of situation. Um, suppose we were not talking about central banks not working in Argentina, or, but we were talking about governments or parliaments not working. Um, would the solution be let's bring someone from the outside to take over the parliament or to take over the government in a way to colonize? What I'm trying to say here is that I think there's a very important political question of sovereignty um, that is extremely important. And maybe this is the anthropologist in me that is responding to this Fabulous. question. Um, <laughs> that I, I think it's a very delicate question, um, actually. And I would be very hesitant to say that in, an, in this political economy context, we allow it at some level the privatization of central banks. I mean, as bad as central banks might be in Latin America or elsewhere, um, the, so the societies need to basically figure out how to govern their own central banks. And I think that's a very important principle. Um, so I, I don't know if you want to sort of respond by saying that there is a... No, I mean, uh, I, I certainly agree with... I certainly agree with you too. I mean... That's why I said that the real challenge is how do you jump from that immediate solution to a more lasting one, because my, my corollary to the initial answer is how do you make this a more sustainable arrangement? How do, do you make this a public solution? I mean, I don't want to, to establish a perfect parallelism here, but it's not that dissimilar if somebody like the IMF comes and say, now you have to do this, like you have to apply a currency board. Well, a currency board is for a country can be something completely extraneous as some, some uh, algorithm provided by a Silicon Valley <laughs> company. As a matter of fact, the, 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 conver the convertibility would be almost an algorithm. Now, if the country doesn't make it its own, if it's imposed by the IMF, it's a political problem. So now you have to see how can you integrate them and how can you solve the, the, the public policy issue. Uh, it's a challenge, it's a challenge. But uh, you know, a good technological solution might help at the beginning, but then you have to see how it morphs into for something more lasting and in a way where people feel that is their solution. Thank Alan. Um, since we're all practicing amateur anthropology here, I want to ask you a question about the crossing of the hoodie culture and the gray pinstripe suit <laughs> culture, and in particular, the what I would have thought is the likelihood, but let's just say the possibility, that the hoodie culture doesn't want to cross that line and they see their business model as the segment of the population, it's not the whole population, that doesn't trust 
the gray pinstripe suit culture and trust Google and Facebook more. Don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those, but, uh, <laughs> but, but there are uh, people like that in general. And then the second part of the question is, if you see any truth to that, as you look generationally, as people our age disappearing from the planet and being replaced by people that are now young, there being more and more of the in Google I trust rather than, uh, never mind God, whatever's on our money. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yes, I mean, that's a challenge. I think, I think one way of combating that is precisely by, by, by the public sector to provide an alternative, you know? I mean, if Bitcoin comes and there is nothing more than Bitcoin, those who do not necessarily care about the fact that there is no government behind, but what they are enticed about is the technological aspect, then the way to attract those people is by, by, pro, by providing a technological response. I mean, I certainly think, I mean, I think that from a, a trend point of view, what, what everybody wants, or pretty much the young population wants, is to do everything is in their handheld. The least thing they want is to have to go to a bank. The least thing they want to do is to even go to an ATM. So if you want them to use cash, you, you cannot make them go to an ATM or to a branch to get cash. You need to provide them the solution. And I think central banks should be really mindful about that and either provide the solutions themselves or provide infrastructure for the private sector to provide that solution. So I think that would be the attitude I will take, is not to, to be passive, but to try to identify at the end what those people want. And at the end, what people want is adequate financial services. That's the margin at which we can do something happen, to make something happen. Any more questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Adriano Rampini, uh, what is the case for the central bank um, providing the solution itself as opposed to the providing infrastructure? I thought it was very insightful to, to say that in some sense central bank has been a success in providing uh, stable stores of value. Mm -hmm. and maybe less of a success or, or uh, in providing fast payment systems or at least in uh, having a regulatory framework in, in, in place that allows technological progress in payment systems. And, but that to me suggests uh, thinking harder about the, the infrastructure that's provided and the regulatory framework that, that might obstruct technological progress in payment systems as opposed to providing central bank currencies or providing the alternatives um, by having central bank, the central bank provide the alternative. Yeah. No, I mean, I would be more in your camp. I mean, I would be more in having a minimalist role for central banks, a key role, but minimalist. I would say providing the foundations and let then the industry develop. Uh, there are, and the, the, one, the one of the reasons, I mean, there are many reasons why I, I cannot completely discard the idea or I won't discard the idea of central banks providing some of these uh, even retail services is because there is this debate, which is a very interesting debate, uh, where some people say, let's, let's imagine a world without cash. Today you have the option of cash. Cash offers huge, it's very efficient in many types of payments, but also offers you a store of value that is really re readily accessible and is anonymous. So for technological reasons, 
is optimal to take that option away from society, yes or no? And some people say it's better if that option is there. Now, are you going to offer it in a digital fashion, yes or no? So that's, that's where, where I, the only, re, probably the main instance where I would say that the central banks could provide a solution. But that, that comes from there, not necessarily from the point of view of the central bank should be the dominant in the financial system or should displace the private sector. Of course, that's not what I'm arguing for. Question over there. Moritz Lennel. Uh, I feel that two questions are easily mixed in this debate. One is the technical implementation of payment instruments, and one is the emergence of a new unit of account, which is kind of separate, it seems, mm -hmm. from, from how, how we are implementing that. And um, um, this emergence of a new unit of account um, would probably limit the effectiveness of monetary policy of domestic central banks, similar to like involuntary dollarization that some countries um, uh, experience. And this, do you feel? Governments, central banks around the world are prepared to think about the, their own abilities, technically and legally, of preventing such an emergence of a, a new unit of account that would limit their ability to, to control monetary policy? Is that not really the, 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 the key question when we think about like something like Bitcoin, that like central banks would not be able to implement monetary policy anymore themselves? Yes, I mean, it's, it's an important issue, no? Uh, at the end, the, the sovereignty in monetary policy implementation is very, it's very, very big. Now, that's why also, I mean, it's a threat that, that you, you face too, not in a country, let's say, like the U.S., but in a country like where I come from, which is Mexico, uh, or some Latin American country, where at some point we have faced massive dollarization. And that's basically your, your money is being displaced by something else. Now, in the past, it has been because of the capacity to guarantee the value of a currency. And if not, people look for some, something else. Now, if it's for, for technological reasons, there is where central banks should be able to compete. I mean, we, we should do our job in the, from the point of view of preserving the value of the currency. And I think that sense central banks have an advantage because I think that uh, central banks are not there to look for profits where a private supplier would, would be. Uh, but I think also now, from a technological point of view, central banks should have the capacity to compete. And that's why we are advocating to develop that capacity. Question there. Uh, thank you for your talk. Just following up from your previous points about how uh, central banks are ultimately also political institutions and, and some of the issues we talked about. I think um, with the risk of oversimplification, I guess a lot of people might say that uh, one reason why cryptocurrency or big tech's involvement in financial services haven't been successful so far is that you know you got the status quo, the, the existing players that feel really reluctant uh, to let them in because ultimately, even though even if the status quo has a lesser or uh, worse system, why would they have the political incentive to give up power and let outside players to come in here that is taking a piece of their cake. I, I don't know if you, uh, how would you respond to this uh, kind of, kind of uh, argument? Do you, do you foresee any situation where, say, there is a wonderful system of decentralized payment system like Libra that actually figures out what's going on and is actually better than the current system? And as impossible as they may sound, uh, do you think Central banks would say, I, I just feel very reluctant to, to collaborate uh, in that sense. Again, I think it's very generalized and oversimplified. I think that's a long way of saying turkeys don't vote for Christmas, or do they? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what I say is, is, why do central banks exist? And it's because different, precisely the process of uncovering reliable units of account and re re reliable money the, that quest has been very long and very painful. The fact that in most countries there is the monopoly in the issues of currency is because of all the lessons that were learned in the past. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's almost like the legal system. Why does the government have 
a monopoly in administering, in administering uh, uh, el, el, el legal, having an, uh, uh, the rule of law. Well, I think that there, it's a very similar argument to have the central bank as the one who is in charge of providing an adequate a unit of account, store of value, medium of exchange that will allow the economy to work, you know? And that's why I talk in, in, in my speech and in, in, in what I presented, I discussed of public goods, central bank public goods. I think that's a key issue, a key role of the government. And, and, I, and I just don't think that the private sector can, on a sustainable, reliable basis, play that role. I think we are pretty much out of time, and I think it's been a fascinating debate. Um, I mean, I take away a number of conclusions from your speech. Um, firstly, that you know, Mark Zuckerberg and his ilk like to say that their role or their aim in life is to, to disrupt. And even if they haven't actually disrupted the financial payment system yet, as you say, they have disrupted the intellectual framework of mm -hmm. central banking mm -hmm. and force central bankers and economists to confront a group of issues in a hurry that frankly they haven't had to confront for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So that's fascinating. So in that respect, I absolutely applaud the efforts that the BIS is making to try and bring some intellectual co coherence to this debate and actually force central bankers and economists to think about the implications of this disruption. Um, you know, I think there's a wide spectrum of enthusiasm in the central banking community mm -hmm. in different parts of the world about the degree to which they want to think about this or not. Yes. But you're certainly managing to accelerate that disruptive process. Um, it's going to be an interesting, interesting path. I mean, there is a need for an intellectual framework, as you say, between looking at the payment system, looking at the intermediation function. Um, and obviously, that is further complicated by the political dimension to this mm -hmm. and it's also complicated by the geographical dimension. I mean one thing I find fascinating is the degree that not only to which not only are emerging markets leapfrogging and potentially creating reverse innovation but on issues like trust which as you say are so central to how the political economy works and what central banks do that varies across different cultures right now. I mean China is fascinating. I very much hope you have an outpost, not just in Silicon Valley, but in China, because as it happens, there's a group of anthropologists who've been doing a lot of work looking at Chinese attitudes towards technology and trust, and finding, for example, that it's not just a case of going from trust in institutions to trust in Google. In China, you're going to trust in cyber technology backed by the government and concepts of privacy and trust are very different there right now in terms of how the financial system is playing out. And people don't necessarily object, it seems, to some of the techniques that we might find very intrusive in America because there's a different concept of societal trust. So that's a very long-winded way of saying I applaud what you're doing. Thank you. I wish you the very best of luck in bringing together the hoodies and the pinstripe <laughs> cultures. Um, I would love as an anthropologist to be a fly on the wall <laughs> when you actually create that um, new laboratory or test tube. And it's certainly something that I hope that everyone in the room pays attention to. And my one last plea was if there was ever a moment when there's a need for cultural analysis and anthropology alongside the economics, it's now. So, yes. best of luck in all of you in getting your hoodies and talking to some <laughs> anthropologists. Thank you. Thank you.